Well, the one thing that geeks won't tell you, compressors make your voiceover better, and most of the time, they're not gonna tell you why. If you really wanna know a little bit about compressors and why we use them and why I recommend you always use them on voiceover, stay tuned in this episode of Audio Barnyard. And welcome to another edition of the Audio Barnyard Podcast with Don Barnes. I'm Donnie Barnes. We're brought to you, as usual, by VOJumpstart.com, where we show you how to produce better audio faster. You can schedule a free 15-minute phone call or Zoom call with Don if you would like to do so at VOJumpstart.com. So, yes, today we're talking about compression. And I think generally people are vaguely aware in voiceover that we need to use a compressor for some reason but it rarely seems to be it rarely rarely seems to get explained why what is a compressor and what is its role in voiceover a compressor at the end of the day is about making you more intelligible meaning somebody can understand what you say and it's easier for them to decode what we're saying i guess we really don't think about it i talk donnie talks and then uh, we hear each other and we go oh yeah 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 and we get it quote unquote but there's a whole process going on in our brain to decode. And if he spoke a different language, I don't understand what he's saying. Or maybe I only get bits and pieces of it if he was speaking a language that I don't understand. When we're doing voiceover, they don't get to see our face. And so a compressor, when done right, is going to fill in some blanks and make it easier for people to understand what your message is toward them. Yeah, and until about 100 years ago or so, Humans didn't have to really worry much about just hearing somebody's voice. You always saw somebody when they were speaking to you. Tell us what happened about a century ago that started to change that for the first time. Yeah, well, I, I think it's, uh, if I remember my stats right, don't quote me on this, but it's uh, 1896 is the first time a radio was patented. Marconi was the first radio guy that got a patent on that. And then it was probably the 1930s or so before radios were available. And one of our presidents, uh, Franklin, I, I believe, I, I get it mixed up. But point is this. Franklin about, Delano Roosevelt. You're that's the about guy, his, his, see? His fireside chats, yes. Yes. So in that point, well, I, I, the backstory on that is that he didn't like that he wasn't getting great press, so he decided to circumvent the press and uh, go directly to people and tell them his story, and he got elected. So it worked great. And in that process, by the time you get to about the 50s, then everybody had a radio that had come down in price. And, you know, it wasn't everybody, everybody, but it was very, very prevalent across the United States. And when people were talking on radio, then everyone's sitting around the radio listening, trying to hear what they're saying. Uh, the Lone Ranger was on. They listened to the story. They like the story and they needed to understand them. And some engineers figured out that, boy, you know, I could do some things that would make it more comfortable for the listeners to understand. And that was the beginning of compression. It's been around, you know, like for most of us, our whole lives, we've hit it. But if you think back before radio, you and I could never talk unless we could see each other. I mean, this is amazing. Zoom, you're 1,500 miles away from me, 1,000 miles away. I don't know what it is, but you're, we're not obviously not in the same room. Uh, I don't think Zoom has been around in 100 years. Well, so, but radio hasn't been around 100 years either. But imagine before that, our great, great, great grandfather, grandmother, when they wanted to talk, they had to be within shouting distance of each other in order to hear them, and they visually could see. So our brain is optimized for two senses. And so the nut, the reason a compressor exists is to, and is so widely used today, is to fill in some information that normally our brain was optimized to have two senses, and now it only has one. Yeah, that is really. Uh, counterintuitive now to think about. We're so used to hearing disembodied voices throughout our daily lives. It's it's always tough to imagine a, a time when it was different. But yeah, if you think about thousands and thousands of years of, of human life and civilization, we're lived without that ability. And so it would make sense that our brains are not really that adapted to just hearing versus hearing and seeing someone at the same time. You ever, uh, if you if you if you if you're watching a movie, or you're watching Netflix, or you're watching something else, one of the things that happens all the time, it just it's it's so prevalent, no one even notices it. But if the actor, I'm going to do this, he turns around from the mic and they have to say a line back here. What are the what does the producer of that do? They do something called ADR, and they put in that voice so that they're facing a mic that they get a good pickup, and it's tweaked so that 
you know, if you're sitting and watching it, you actually hear what the char- what the character said, and so you can follow along with the story. But if they didn't do that, and there's a reason they do that all the time in movies, television, anything where they're filming them, is because when we can see each other, uh, there's a whole bunch of information transmitted. It's also why a person who's hard of hearing uh, that they can understand an amazing amount of information without ever hearing us, because it's all being it's all happening right there in our face. And most people just don't think about it. When they're hearing a voice, they've got no information coming from a visual to fill in a bunch of blanks. And a good compressor will do some things to allow a person who's only hearing to have more information and then fill in blanks that are actually missing from what the two senses they would normally have. Right. So most people that have been in voiceover for a while have some experience if they're engineers or producers pretty much everybody agrees on the fact that some kind of compression is needed. There can be debate on exactly how to do it or what kind of compressor or process to use. You also hear from some newer folks who are just getting into the business, some hesitancy sometimes because they'll say things like, oh, well, I just want my, I don't want to do things to my voice to change it. I I want it to sound natural. Uh, What do you say when, when people raise concerns about not having their voice sound quote unquote natural anymore? Yeah, well, so the term natural, it's one of those great terms. I really love natural. Uh, Cyanide is natural. Uh, Mushrooms. Hey, mushrooms are awesome. Love them on burgers, love them on lots of things. But there is also poison mushrooms. So those are natural and could kill me. Cyanide could kill me. If I had mercury, there's just a hundred things in life that are natural. And so I kind of think of it a little bit differently. I want to sound comfortable. I want to sound... I don't know, I, inviting wouldn't be the right word, but I certainly want, so what would be some good words about that instead of, uh, it's it's not just natural, it's comfortable. Yeah. What what do you think there? Warm, of course, conversational is, is very much the buzzword over the last few years. Uh, intelligible. Engaging, relatable. Okay. Yeah. So all those things, If uh, and, and at the end of the day, one of the things that's critically important that people don't think about is if they cannot understand me or the details of what I'm saying, and it's intelligibility. If I speak with a, an accent that is so heavy compared to what you're used to, then it's not decodable. And when you take away the visuals, then parts of that are not decodable and it's hard to listen to people. So a good compressor, it does two things. Number one, it brings down some of the loudest points in our audio and it, it, it compresses it down this way. But the secondary thing that a good compressor does is it takes the parts that are very quiet and it brings those up. And a lot of those very quiet things that it brings up is where it's filling in information that normally I don't need to hear every detail to know what somebody says. But if I bring up some of those, then I'm listening to them only. Those things that are brought up are filling in things that I would have seen you say. And now with a compressor, it's doing a subtle job. And when they're done right, it sounds normal. It sounds like we're in the same room talking where what we don't realize is Donnie and I are sitting across from each other at a dinner table sometime and we're talking. We are also tend to be looking at each other and we can see those details so we don't miss the, the parts of words that are actually quieter than others. So a good compressor does two things. It brings down some of the things that are extra loud and it brings up some details that aren't loud enough that normally wouldn't matter because I could see you. If I could see you, I don't need those things brought up, but we're doing voiceover. And obviously, I don't know. I don't remember doing a voice. You do broadcast things where sometimes they see you on TV. That's fine. But you're on radio to 90% of the time. And in those situations, when you're broadcasting, they can't see you. So their brain has to decode what you're saying. And a good compressor makes that better for them. Right. And good compressor is the operative term there, right? Because compressors are not necessarily created equal. And I think this is a misconception that a lot of people have. It's sort of like saying, well, coffee is good. Yeah. Uh, well, yes, but there are a lot of different ways to make coffee, and some of them are uh, much more sophisticated and uh, artisan, if you if you will, and produce a, a much higher quality result than just uh, dumping some instant Folgers through a, through a filter. I probably shouldn't mention a specific brand. If Folgers would like me to perform a voiceover for them, I'm happy to do so. 
<laughs> but you know, there's different kind, many different kinds and grades of coffee. There's many different kinds and grades and processes of making pizza, and there are many different types of compressors. So, what should we look for, and what do we need to know about the different kinds of compression we could potentially apply? Compressors are often confused with a term called levelers. And what levelers do is they tend to only look at the top peaks and they do bring some of those down and they'll level out the audio. And where a good compressor is bringing up some quiet parts and bringing down. So when it's talking about compression, most of us think of squeezing something. We don't think of bringing parts up where the good quality compressors do both. And then so out in the marketplace, like I'll, I'll give you an example of something I don't care for. And there's an old product that's not as widely used now called Levelator. And Levelator is based on the concept of leveling where they were bringing things down. And a lot of times that can hit specs. And one of the problems we run into in this business is I can hit a set of specifications in terms of some numbers that are required maybe for an audiobook uh, publisher, but that doesn't mean it sounds good. And these levelers were very often bringing things down, but they weren't doing what a good compressor was. There are some tools that combine different things and there are different terms, but here's the thing. Compressors are kind of an art. And so the, the people that create them, they have all sorts of choices like the pizzas Donnie mentioned or coffee, where just because I'm making coffee doesn't mean I'm making great coffee. Uh, it, there's a whole set of steps in there that how I roast it, how I pick it, how ripe they were, how you dry them. I mean, I'm not a coffee expert, but all the little details that go into that are going to make a different cup of coffee. And then when it gets to me, I've even heard how hot your water is makes a big difference by if it's five degrees or 10 degrees hotter makes a difference. And it's the same kind of thing with a compressor where the engineers that put it together have a hundred different choices. And there is not, oh, this is a compressor. I mean, there's the concept of what it is, but that'd be like saying this is chocolate. There isn't one chocolate or one coffee. And so now what you're looking for are a set of developers or a team that they are very tuned into what makes audio sound great. And a tool like Levelator that's biggest claim to fame was it was for broadcasters. It was originally created for males. Um, when They gave it away, and I predict, because... When they went to go try to say, wow, would people buy this? They found out it didn't work very well for females. And then to generalize it and make it work for everybody, it never was great for everybody. Even it would be inconsistent with one voice if they're doing a wide set of things, doing audiobooks with different characters. And then to generalize that these they couldn't do it. So they just gave it away. And unfortunately, I always think when I see people that are using that, I think, oh, no, they are not listening to the results of that and comparing it to what a good compressor does. Uh, if they would, they would never use that product. So I do question people that are kind of recommending it. And I just think, well, uh, they're good people, but they haven't done their homework in terms of listening to the results. And sometimes they're just trying to hit a spec. And that's, you know, fine in the beginning stages. You got to walk before you run. But don't stick with some of these tools that are, you know, I, I hate to say it, but some of the music production people they invest heavily in making sure that the compressors work really well. And if you really want my inside scoop, I love the ones that are based on some sort of tube. Uh, and, and, you know, why? Because they sound better. When you A, B, 20, 30, 40, 50 voices, and you've got something that's based on a tube emulation, if it's today, or some in the old days, based on the tube technology, those sound great with voiceover and they're head and shoulders above some of the modern ones that are there that are 100% digital and they work well, but not as well, not as comfortably as some of the ones that are that are based on a, a kind of the, the sound of tubes. Uh, it's bizarre. We're getting in, the, getting in the weeds there, but it's just always, when you listen over and over again, 100 people, they'll go, I don't know why, that just sounds better. And it's like great coffee, great chocolate, great pizza, a great car that you, you get in the car and you just go, I don't know, everything just like feels right. It's comfortable. It rides great. It accelerates exactly how I think it should. The brakes are comfortable and smooth where all the little components came together and you go, wow, this is really a great car. I love what they did with this thing, as opposed to nice shiny rims on an old beater that's, you know, 20 years old, that's got a bad engine that's falling apart, but it looks good on the outside because, hey, at least I polish it. <laughs> it's a car, so, right? What's the difference? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah. Uh, it's like most things in life. 
there are differences among the better quality ones and the and and the free. And I, you know what? If someone puts out a free one, and there's another one, Loud Max is out there, and a lot of people use Loud Max. And Loud Max was designed. It's more of a leveler, but it does have some compression components in it. But it's more of a leveler. And it was designed for music, and it was designed to make music as loud as possible and hit a set of specs. Two kind of contradictory things, but they do a great job. You're doing music. You're doing hip-hop music, man. You want something like Loud Max. It works very well. You don't necessarily want that one. I mean, that's a good one. I'm just saying there's that one, and there are some that are even upgraded from that. But those tools were not designed and tested and put together just to be voiceover tools. So they're they're okay, and they're... If that's what you have, go for it. That there are better tools out there for making this stuff happen. All right. So as we wrap up today, I think if somebody's listened to us this whole way through, they're probably thinking, okay, I get it now. You've established that, yes, I need a compressor. Yes, it's a good thing to have. And you're telling me that there are many different varying qualities of compressors, though. What am I supposed to do with that? How do I know where to find good compressors if they're so important? Yep. So number one, you're almost always going to go with one of the tools that were originally designed for music. Those people spend crazy amounts of time on their compressors. I'll give you an example real quick. The Studio One has multiple compressors available. Uh, just in the box, there are two, and then they have a whole bunch. You, if you want to purchase their little a- extra packs, and they have like four or five of them that are based on tube emulations. Okay, a term based on. So this just means... In the 1970s, 80s, 90s, there were some boxes, some physical hardware compressors that were based on tubes. And so what these engineers did was they decomposed that and they put it in so that we could run it off the computer and sound just like those things that were working in the 70s and 80s and that kind of time frame. Great stuff that was used in recording studios back in the day. What they've done is brought it forward into the modern era. And now I can sound like I'm running through a $5,000 tube compressor with a piece of software that's under a hundred bucks. So Studio One has a great one. Uh, Check out the DAW you're using and see if it has a tube emulation, a compressor based on the sound of a tube back in the day. And for voiceover, man, those are a killer secret sauce that you can add to your arsenal to make yourself sound better. And people won't know why. They'll just go, I don't know, Donnie sounds better. I don't know why. And and then you want to have that little competitive edge by having something like that. And Studio One's a great example. There's some other great DAWs out there, and they also have those great tools, or there are plugins available. So if you're using something else and you don't know, hey, give me a shout. Book 15 minutes with it. We'll go find something that works in your solution. Uh, the easy button, go. Studio One's got them built in, and they're available. And for under 100 bucks, you can be using those too. Yeah. And if and if you're tired of hearing us advocate for Studio One, I mean, look, we respect all DAWs. There are other good DAWs too. We we have no uh, uh, no uh, complaints about that. But there are reasons we advocate for Studio One, and their compressors are actually one of those subtle things that does really set Studio One apart from others. So as always, if you're looking for a ready-made system and setup and processing stack that can increase your audio quality and dramatically cut your processing time, you can do that over at VOJumpstart.com. Again, feel free to set up a free 15-minute session with Don. There's a direct link to do that over at that site. Until next time, for Don Barnes, I'm Donnie Barnes. This has been the Audio Barnyard Podcast. And as always, we'll see you on the wires. Bye-bye.